Hello, everyone. Welcome to the McMaster Health Forum here at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. This is our latest Queen Elizabeth Scholarship uh, uh, webinar and presentation by our returning scholars who went abroad uh, visiting our partners as part of the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program. There's an agenda for our presentations today. There are three scholars presenting during this session. Uh, I will first give you a little bit of information about our scholarship program and then turn it over to each of our scholars. The McMaster Health Forum is uh, the leading hub for improving health outcomes through collective problem solving. We harness information, convene stakeholders, prepare action-oriented leaders, and act as an agent of change by empowering stakeholders. The Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program is run by a partnership between the Rideau Hall Foundation, Community Foundations of Canada, Universities Canada, and the individual Canadian universities. The purpose of the program is to activate a dynamic community of young global leaders across the Commonwealth to create lasting impacts both at home and abroad through cross-cultural exchanges encompassing international education, discovery and inquiry, and professional experiences. The version of the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program here at the McMaster Health Forum is called Strengthening Health Systems. Our scholars will contribute to strengthening health systems and become part of our large and growing network of health system leaders. Today's presentation is actually the last presentation by scholars from this original QES program here at the Forum. I say that because the Forum is one of 20 Canadian institutions to be awarded a new or second Queen Elizabeth Scholarship program that will run till 2021. This new program here at the Forum is called Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program in Strengthening Health and Social Systems. And from the name, you can see that there's a slight difference in this program as opposed to the original program. The location of the internships has expanded. Uh, before, we could only send scholars to Commonwealth countries. Now we can send scholars to Commonwealth Plus low and middle income countries. Because of this, our partners have expanded. We now have partners in Colombia and Lebanon. And the focus of our internships has expanded to include social systems. Because of this last uh, element, we've also expanded the eligibility criteria. And therefore, students who are in the arts and sciences program in the undergraduate uh, system here at McMaster are also eligible for the, for the scholarship. But in the big picture, we are reducing the number of overall scholars across the course of the scholarship program uh, due to funding and other such issues. So with that said, here from our original QES program is the initial cohort. They primarily went away in 2016 or visited us in the same year. Our second cohort was much larger, with a little bit of a, a glitch on the, the slide there. But we had a, a large number of students who went abroad in 2017 or visited us in that year. And our third and final cohort, of which the scholars presenting today are uh, a part, uh, primarily visited us or went away in 2018. I'm pleased to present to you our scholar presenter, who is Yina, an undergraduate student in the Bachelor of Health Sciences program specializing in global health at the time of her internship. And she is, at the time of this recording, still in that program, I believe. <laughs> uh, she has an interest in addressing health inequities through system strengthening and evidence-informed decision-making. And during her internship, Yina hoped to gain critical insights into the process of harnessing evidence in multi-sectoral collaboration to drive systems change. So, ladies and gentlemen, Yina. Thank you so much, Jane. So I'd also like to take some time before I begin my presentation to quickly reflect and recognize how we're related to the land that we're meeting on right now. Um, and for many of us, this is, the, this is the land that we have settled on for several years already and will continue to for years to come. Um, and my position as a settler is something that I began to consider more critically as I moved and traveled from one colonized land to another in Australia. And in both of these areas, land acknowledgements are frequently used um, before events or lectures, yet the fundamental rights and sovereignty of Indigenous peoples on these um, lands continue to be systematically undermined. Um, and I'm also not best positioned to deliver this land acknowledgement, but I'm hoping to do so as a small action of solidarity with um, the people in, who are traditionally in the lands of Hamilton and in Sydney, where I completed my internship. So Hamilton is Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe traditional territory, which is protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. And that signifies that we should all share this land and its resources, um, limiting what we take to leave enough for others and for future, for future abundance. I'd also like to pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, who, were the traditional, who are the tra traditional custodians of the land that I had the privilege of calling home for three months. 
And I think all of us as individuals working to strengthen health systems and health outcomes, it's critical that we consider our positions in these contexts, colonial contexts, and how we can uh, draw attention to the issues facing local indigenous communities. So with that, uh, I'll begin my presentation. Uh, first, I'll talk about some contextual information, um, and then I'll go into details about the two projects that I worked on ending off with some key lessons and personal adventures as well. So uh, my internship was situated in Sydney, which is a city in New South Wales, and that is one of six states in Australia. So the New South Wales government, to give some context, has 10 key departments. Uh, and then within each department, there are several agencies. Um, the two main government groups that uh, our project involved was the New South Wales Ministry of Health as well as the Office of Environment and Heritage. A little more information about those two uh, government bodies. Under New South, Wales, New South Wales Health, we were consulting with the Environmental Health Branch, um, which is responsible for developing guidelines and policy for various issues within public and environmental health and the Office of the Environment, uh, sorry, the Office of Environment and Heritage, which is an agency in the Department of Planning and Environment. And their primary goal is to protect New South Wales environment and heritage. Now moving on to the academic context. Uh, my internship was situated at the Sydney School of Public Health at the University of Sydney, and specifically within their climate change, human health, and social impacts node. This node is a partnership between the university as well as the aforementioned government bodies. And its objective is to investigate the intersection between human health policy and climate change to one, better understand how climate change impacts our communities and two, to inform adaptation programs to protect and promote health in the face of these challenges. And closely related to that was the recently uh, launched Planetary Health Platform. Um, and this is a relatively new concept, but one succinct way of putting it is that planetary health is about safeguarding the health and well-being of, future, of current and future generations through rethinking the way we feed, move, house, power, and care for the world. And this is said by do Dr. Tony Capen, who is the di current director of the platform. Um, it tries to do this through developing multidisciplinary research on the relationships between human health and our natural systems. And it, it also aims to provide leadership in terms of policy, industry, and commun communities on these complex questions related to planetary health. And as the last piece of contextual information, um, I was introduced to the idea of systems thinking, which I hadn't heard of prior to this internship. Um, but it proves to be very essential in addressing complex challenges in other sectors and also within health. So there are many different, de uh, different, def different definitions that have been put out, but one of them is that system thinking is a mindset that views systems and their subcomponents as being intimately interrelated and connected. And our understanding of how these things work is essential um, to interpret these relationships and interactions within and between systems. And also a key concept under a system thinking is system dynamics, which looks at the way that feedback systems um, can change in response to internal and external factors, and to apply this knowledge to improve policy making and health outcomes. Um, in the context of health system strengthening, it's important to take a holistic approach to problem solving that looks at problems as part of a wider dynamic system and looking at these components not in isolation, so not how one uh, component is related to another individually, but how they interact and react with different components over time. And using systems thinking is really important to reveal complex relationships because often some of these relationships are not direct and you need several st steps to see the linkage. Um, and applying this to health, it's important to understand how factors within and also outside of the health system, um, such as variables related to environmental conditions and energy use, ultimately impact um, that health system. And a key tool that's used in system thinking approaches is causal loop diagrams. And they're 
uh, interesting representations of systems, um, trying to look at the ways that the different components interact with each other. So very quickly, I'll just go over that comp the components of that simplified example. So birth and deaths are things that contribute to population, impact population. Population also impacts births and deaths. Um, the arrows represent um, either positive or negative polarity, so a causal link. And the R with the circular loop um, represents a reinforcing feedback loop, whereas the B represents a balancing feedback loop. And then the two, dash, uh, the two lines um, represent elapsed time, so that causal link may take some time before it plays out. And this was used um, in this next project that I'll talk about. So the main project I was working on related to thermal stress and comfort and health. So as we all know, um, climate change has been an emerging issue and it's also resulted in significant uh, temperature changes and that has had significant effects on health um, for the individuals living in New South Wales and Australia. Um, and so the goal of this project was to use a systems approach to guide future planning and implementation of heat adaptation strategies to protect and promote health in an urban context. And I'll skip the objectives because they'll be discussed later on. But these are the key components of this project. So before I began my internship, um, the individuals working on this project conducted a collaborative conceptual mapping workshop. So this was convened by the Planetary Health Platform and the Office of Environment and Heritage. And they took multi multidisciplinary researchers as well as uh, policymakers from different levels and sectors of government um, to come together and brainstorm the ways in which thermal stress and thermal comfort interacts with energy use um, and health. And after this conceptual uh, brainstorming, I helped with the uh, review of literature evidence, um, looking at different strategies and interventions that could intervene um, to uh, intervene within the system. And that also in included assessing the quality of evidence. And after that, I looked at um, the existing policies in place in the state of New South Wales uh, in reviewing and analyzing, comparing across sectors. And finally, the objective is to create um, actionable recommendations. So just to begin very quickly, these are two examples of some of the causal loop diagrams that came out of that workshop that was discussed. And it illustrates some of uh, the ideas that stakeholders had in mind about how comfort is related to health and well-being as well as energy use and built infrastructure. Um, and generally, this is what guided our brainstorming for different interventions and potential ways uh, to address thermal comfort. And then the next part was the evidence review. Uh, we looked at studies from, or we searched the databases, Medline Scopus and Web of Science using the following search strategy. And the results, which are still in progress, so the team is still working on it in Sydney, um, revealed several main themes of different intervention areas and leverage points, including green spaces, the design of urban spaces, uh, and the design of buildings. Um, there were also several studies specifically within airflow and cooling, cooling strategies, but it's important to note that these aren't necessarily interventions at a policy level, but rather simply determinants of thermal stress and comfort, and so they shouldn't be dependent on. Depended on. And uh, the third part was the policy review, and the, those search terms were used in various New South Wales government websites and resources to try to find policy documents that were related to thermal comfort and heat health. Uh, so some of the uh, questions we looked at was who are the stakeholders, who is the intended audience, um, what's the overall focus of the policy, does the policy address any of those interventions that we noted in the workshop or in the evidence review? And is the meaning clear? Most importantly, how does it compare or contrast with other policy documents that we came across? Um, and so we did look at quite a few policy documents, but just to draw attention to New South Wales Health, health it was quite interesting um, because the department didn't actually have a policy 
on thermal comfort or heat. They had government resources and public resources related to heat. Um, however, we did speak with the environmental health policy analyst, and they also um, substantiated that there wasn't currently um, a, a specific policy to address this issue. So that is one area of concern and potential action. And to summarize what we found from these reviews, um, out of the 10 departments that, we, that was mentioned in the beginning, um, only six of them had, had any relevant policies to our, our strategy, sorry, to our research. Um, and also the ones that we did find had policies had a wide variance in the target, um, in their target intervention. So for example, in health, although it wasn't really a policy, their campaign was really focused on educating the public and um, individual adaptation, whereas other departments such as the one of planning and environment under which um, the Office of uh, the Environment and Heritage is, um, or belongs to, focused more on proactive measures within urban planning and emissions reduction, and they specifically linked that to um, health. And the implications of our findings is that there are really complex links within the system of thermal stress, thermal comfort, energy use, and health. And because of this, um, a multi-sectoral systems approach is needed to reduce the health impact of, of heat. And to avoid consequences, such as uh, exacerbating the urban heat island effect. Um, and then based on our evidence review, we hope to proceed with recommendations. And in the future, we'll need to also consider the economic Im implications of both the interventions and of health impacts. Say if we were to continue um, using AC at high levels to respond to the heat, to respond to heat waves, what are the long-term economic and health implications? Um, and just very quickly going through the second project, uh, the objective was to look at how can we establish healthy and sustainable food systems in a healthcare setting. And the reason we were looking at food is because uh, the food system contributes approximately to 60 to 30 percent of greenhouse gas emissions globally. And it also contributes to the production of solid and water waste as well as air pollutants. However, this means that there are opportunities to intervene at many different stages, um, including the processing of food, the distribution, marketing, and consumption. And why healthcare settings? Um, first, sustainable diets have been shown in evidence to be healthy diets as well. Um, as well, healthcare settings such as hospitals sit at um, the intersection between health and sustainability, and they have a lot of potential to improve the health of the general population while also contributing to sustainability efforts. And uh, this was mainly an evidence review, so identifying strategies that would allow us to um, support healthy and sustainable food systems in hospitals, um, and three databases were searched, and the themes that came out of that were uh, the importance of targeting different stages of the food cycle. So in terms of food proc procurement, um, encouraging hospitals to establish local partnerships with producers. In terms of food marketing, the way in which um, the food is labeled or products are placed in the, in the physical environment does make a difference. Um, engaging the community and educating the public. Um, collaborating with different healthcare facilities. Uh, to make a statement towards the producers of food, and ultimately, again, using a systems thinking, uh, systems thinking multi-sectoral approach. And so some of the key lessons that I took away from these two projects. Um, first, climate and health, it is a very complex relationship, and it probably would take many, many years to map out completely. Um, however, this also means that there are a lot of opportunities to intervene and make a difference, make an impact on improving the health system. As well, systems thinking was something that was very new to me, and I definitely see its value now in tackling really complex, um, not only health issues, but also socioeconomic issues. And lastly, it's important to collaborate between different sectors um, because 
health systems don't exist in a silo. They are always interacting with uh, different sectors. And so in order to see a sustainable and significant change, I think it's necessary to communicate, coordinate, and establish partnerships between different sectors. Uh, now on to the fun things <laughs> as well. Um, I'm a little bit of a nerd, so I went to a lot of public lectures at the University of Sydney and the surrounding area. So on the top left, um, it, was, it was really exciting because uh, there was a Lancet countdown release. Um, and this is the Lancet countdown on climate change and human health. And the Australian, a few Australian universities came together to release one specific to um, Australia's situation uh, in environment, sorry, in climate change and health. And this was the release of um, that report, which is very cool to attend. Um, Oh, on the bottom, I attended a Master's of Sustainability class that was open, and I learned a lot about things in sustainability that I hadn't previously considered, such as the issue of equity or climate change debt, which I found very interesting. And I also went to a poetry slam, um, something that I had never been to before. Um, and then Australia is really just incredibly beautiful, um, as you can see, tell from these images. Um, there are mountains that are accessible, just a, a couple hours train ride away, and then some cool caves, and um, you're by the ocean, so just lots of natural beauty. And a lot of interesting animals. So the first thing I noticed that people asked me when I came back was what kind of animals I see and if I saw any spiders. Oh. Um, so I did see lots of spiders, but actually the highlight were all the other animals that I was able to see. So on the top left is uh, a pool of jellyfish, and I was just sitting by the harbor not realizing that they were jellyfish. I thought they were little lights in the water. <laughs> <laughs> and then they began to move, so I realized, okay, better not dabble into the water. But it was really, really quite magical. Um, the image to the right of that is a bush turkey. Um, they're very common in Australia and quite humorous animals. Uh, and then on the bottom left, there's no animal there, but that was where I spotted a platypus, and that's possibly the greatest um, memory because I've always wanted to see a platypus in real life, and I only saw its back for maybe two seconds, but it's very, very exciting. Oh, I don't think I can... Transition to the next slide. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, and just lots of great food, especially ice cream. And I had a lot of ice cream, so it's really fantastic. Um, and then truly a huge thank you to um, the McMaster Health Forum and Queen Elizabeth Scholarship, uh, Queen Elizabeth Scholarship for making this entire experience possible. Um, I learned a lot about myself and uh, about health systems and systems outside of health as well. And also thank you to the University of Sydney uh, School of Public Health for allowing me to assist with this project. And some specific thank yous. Um, really huge shout out to James because first he made this entire program possible and also because um, you supported us from the very beginning um, and even up till now as well as Dr. John Levis from the Health Forum and uh, Jennifer Landicho for helping me with a lot of last minute travel and um, academic documents. And at the University of Sydney, I'd like to thank my supervisors, Dr. Crane and Dr. Boylan, um, as well as the mentors on the project, so Dr. Tony Capen and Ollie Jay, who were members of the team uh, whom I learned a lot from. And thank you so much. Thanks everyone for joining us today for our latest Queen Elizabeth Scholarship webinar. There's some links on the screen there. Uh, I'm going to ask that you take a look at those when you have the time. That first link, if you have any interest in our uh, new Queen Elizabeth Scholarship program, please visit that link. It has all of the information about the program and how to apply. The second link uh, is a link to all of our presentations when they come up. So 
Uh, as our scholars come back from abroad, they do a webinar just like this one, and we list them all there when the time comes. And then the third, or the, the third link that's on the screen is to our blog page. So our scholars uh, write blog posts, and we post them there to give you a little bit more personal experiences about what they did while they were abroad. So you can look forward to reading a little bit more about their experiences on that website. Uh, and otherwise, thanks for joining us, and we uh, look forward to hearing from all of uh, having all of you tune in again in the future.